Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on government contracting, getting federal contracts. This webinar is sponsored by the Southern Connecticut Black Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Black Chambers and Bridgeport OIC and the SBDC. We have Diana Washington with us. Uh, Diana, do you want to say a few words? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. The Southern Connecticut Black Chamber is a business networking um, organization serving small minority and women-owned businesses in the greater Bridgeport communities from providing educational and informational workshops. We also have free access to bids and we also do MBE certification. Our group is dedicated to creating a level playing field when it comes to providing the same opportunities and resources for our minority and women-owned businesses. And um, we are also very privileged to be a part of the SBA Community Navigators Program. And that um, is a program where we make sure that our small minority and women-owned businesses are aware of the amazing resources and assistance that the SBA provides to our businesses. So I will be putting my information in the, the chat box. So please feel free to use it if you want to um, find out more about the chamber or about the, um, the Navigator program. And once again, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you, Diana. And uh, I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County. I'll be your host today, and <clears throat> our presenter is Jerry Smith. More on Jerry in just a minute. <clears throat> First, some uh, brief info on SCORE. We are the nonprofit national partner of the SBA. SCORE offers three primary value-added services to small business owners, free one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, educational workshops and webinars like this one, over 100 per year. And then we also have extensive resources on our website, including templates to help you build your business plan. We also have a large number of recorded webinars on our website that cover a wide range of business topics. These can be viewed at any time by clicking on the On Demand webinar button on our website. Some useful info about today's event. We have set aside time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat button at any time during the presentation. It's located at the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end sharply at one o'clock to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available on our website within the next day or so. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Jerry Smith is the Director, New England Office of Small Business Utilization, the OSBU. As GSA's small business advocate, the OSBU is committed to providing the best federal small business program information, support, and compliance services in accordance with all applicable federal acquisition laws and directives. Jerry is the GSA regional subject knowledge expert on the federal small business programs. Now I'll turn it over to Jerry. Jerry, it's all yours. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and we appreciate you taking this time out to learn more about federal contracting and opportunities that are available to you as a small business. Even if you're about to migrate to a big business, we hope you will come away from here with a better understanding. It's a lot of information. Don't worry about taking notes. The slide presentation is available to you through SCORE they, so you don't have to write it down. Uh, any questions you have, if you hold them, we'll try and get to all those at the end of it and discuss those. But here's some of the things we want you to know basically about uh, GSA and the federal opportunities that exist to work not only with GSA, but also with most of the federal agencies. Normally we call this, this uh, presentation access and procurement opportunities. A lot of people wanna know, okay, I'm ready to go to that next level. I did city work, I did state work, and now I'm looking at, well, maybe I should dip into the federal pool and see what's there and if I can survive in it. 
Think of the federal government in contracting as the deep end of the swimming pool. You want to make sure that you do all of your uh, lessons and that you're ready for that. And that's why we always recommend that before you look to go anywhere into government service contracting, that you at least get some type of a consultation from either the Small Business Administration, SCORE, uh, WeBank, PTAC, uh, Apex Accelerator, call themselves now. Those are free resources to you that provide you information that will help you move forward. So let's get into the presentation so we can get to the questions. And that's where I get to know you and you get to ask me stuff that's pertinent to your situation. When you get ready to go into the federal sector, here are some steps that you use to develop your leads in federal market. I like to tell companies, you follow the money. No matter how much you want to do business with that agency, no matter how much you think that they're buying what you're selling, if you do your research, you do your market analysis, you should find out which federal agencies are purchasing, purchasing the products or services that you provide. What's your company? You can do that by even looking at what your competition is doing if they're in that space. How much are they buying? Have they awarded any set asides? The big thing about set asides in the federal government is that a set aside is used when we take an um, opportunity and say, we're just going to put this out for you, a woman on small business, service area veteran small business, hub zones, or small disadvantaged business. We can do that. But we can only do that if you guys show an interest in those opportunities. So when you see a source of salt or you see a request for information, uh, you see something come through through the small business dynamic search engine, you get an email. Even though you may not be sure if you are going to be in on that work, show your interest. By showing your interest, you give me the authority then to set it aside. And my thing is, it's always going to be a small business first. And then you have to prove to me that a small business can't do it. But if you're showing no interest, that's easy for a contractor. And I'll say, sorry, Jerry, they, they just don't, they're just not interested in this work. Then the work goes large. The next step is who are my competitors? Who holds the current contract? So who are you competing against? All of you have a competitor out there. There's very few companies out there for they are the sole source of anything anymore. So know who your competitors are, know who's in your space, Know if they're in that space, that federal space, that state space, that municipal space. If they're playing there, then that's how you gauge for that you want to play there and whether you want to take that competition on. And who holds the current contract? Most federal contracts are not just a one-off. They're, they're repetitive. The need may come up every three years, every year. Some of them just continuously run for 10 to 20 years. Knowing who holds the contract will tell you you know, you can go and find out what type of money they were making, how many people they had towards the contract. All that information is public information that you can drill down through several data websites that are available to you about federal contracting. What contracts are set to expire that I can compete for? If a contract was issued one year ago, and this is for five year, you, when it hits that third year, you should be tracking it and start looking at, okay, will the, is that company going to Go after this work again. Is that work over? There's no opportunities there. Or are they going to recompete that contract? You can always ask an agency to recompete a contract. Although someone else holds that contract, when it comes up on the future where it should be ending the fourth year of a five year contract, you can ask that agency that, owns, that issued that contract, do you plan on repeating, you know, repeating this work? And if so, why not? put it back out there so you can get the best price, best interest, best technical solution today, rather than what you got four or five years ago. So that's very important to you as you, as you move forward to capture that, that type of work. Just want to reach over and turn my phone off because I didn't want to wake this up. Okay, let the data refine your overall strategy. I actually let the money and the data. Remember, there is, so much data out there about um, what the government does because the government does so many different things. There's so many buying things. So no matter what you're selling, there's usually some data out there that shows who's buying it, where they're buying it, how much they're buying it for. But the biggest thing is that nobody buys anything in the federal government unless there's a budget, unless there's money authorized by Congress for them to buy. Following the money allows you to look forward. 
when every year when you hear them talking about the annual budget of the federal government, your congressional district uh, economic advisor for your congressman, that person is usually tracking that money because your congressman should be out there fighting to get that money into their district so that they can do good things and do work in their district. It's in the budget. They're tracking it. Call them and say, okay, what type of money, what type of uh, projects are happening in District 2 of Connecticut that I might be able to work on? If I'm construction, what type of construction work? If it's a facility manager, oh, did GSA get money to upgrade their facilities? All these things are always in the budget. Every agency has a budget with line items in there. So if you want to work with Homeland Security, go to Homeland Security budget. If you want to work with the Department of Transportation, go to the Department of Transportation budget and see what money is there. If you don't understand it, that's when you use your resources like SCORE, PTAC, and SBA, and also your congressional delegate. Choose the right events to attend. Sometimes you, you ask yourself, is this a good, good fit for me to go? Is it a waste of my time? It is never a waste of your time to be out talking to other people about your company, about your goods and your services. Even though no one is buying what you are selling, they may know someone who is, or they may come across an opportunity that's not fit for them, but they re might re remember that you did that. So we found here in New England that a lot of the relationships with company to company, business to business, produces more work than any government to business or any you knock it on any agency. Uh, we have several companies here in New England who are very successful because of who they knew in the different areas. So don't, don't, it's not a waste of your time to be seen. It's not a waste of your time to let people know you're doing good work and talking about your company. Always maximize your time at a matchmaking event. You know, hit everybody up, have a list of the, your prime ones you want to hit up, and then the rest of them, hit them as you can. But make sure you always have that list of the people who directly are, have been buying what you do or what you want to make that connection with. Know which agencies forecast tools to use. Every federal agency is required to have a forecast. GSA has what's called the GSA Forecast 2. It is a virtual um, portal that allows you to go and see all the opportunities across GSA, period. You can break them down state by state. You can break them by, down by congressional districts, or however, or by projects, by NICS code. There's so many ways to basically skew that data. But every federal agency is required to have that. If you go to the GSA Forecast 2, you will find multiple agencies on that too. The two was built for the whole federal sector and agencies are slowly migrating their requirements onto that too for a one-stop shopping for people who want to know about forecasts. So if you want to go in, if uh, Department of Interior, I know is on there right now, Department of Labor is on there. So if you have a question about those two agencies, you go to the federal forecast too, which is really owned by GSA. So you can find all that stuff on our website. Always become more efficient in what you do, talking to people about new ideas, talking to people about you know, how they find opportunities, what type of techniques they use. There's a lot in the data industry. Matter of fact, I've always found as a small business, it was easier to use uh, the consultants, the free consultants to do that data because they can help you do a great data search and also do a good market analysis of what you're selling, who's buying, and everything. So here we are at SAM.gov, infamous SAM.gov. Love it, I hate it, it doesn't matter. We can't get rid of it. <laughs> I spend so much time clearing, clearing up issues with SAM.gov. By now, all of you should know about the UEI. The UEI actually took over, uh, replaced the DUNS number. So you have to have a UEI, which is basically a special, identifier for your enterprise. That is actually how a lot of things are tracked in the system now. If you're not registered in SAM.gov, then you can't get paid. You know, but SAM.gov is also a portal where you can find opportunities. You can look for anything that's over $25,000 uh, should be in SAM.gov. They're required to. So every agency should be listing that in, in SAM.gov, except those agencies I, I I think those agencies who have signed up for the GSA 2, some of those don't use SAM.gov anymore. It's all on the two. But SAM.gov is the place to find 
uh, a lot of the opportunities that are there. A search for opportunities for in the RFI sources sought and RFQ stages. So requests for information, requests for quotes, that's going to be in sam.gov too. So you can go in there and do searches. If you're not comfortable with that, use your consultancy. Offers the vendor collaborative collaboration central event listing. So what that is basically is that every vendor in there is putting their information in there. So you can go in there and basically pick people who you might want to partner with, people you might want to do, uh, in, well, not an intern, but a mentor protege uh, relationship with, and identify those things that you can partner and put forth consolidated um, offers rather than offers of your own. Publishes events on the small business events for outreach and training. Most of the agencies do event training. They do small business events. Uh, there's outreach uh, where they trying to reach certain sectors of the market. You'll find all that on SAM.gov. So SAM.gov needs to be your friend. It is how we actually pay you. Um, if you're a nonprofit or you working with a nonprofit and you get grant money, you have to be in SAM.gov for those payments to go. All federal payments right now are associated to your SAM.gov uh, process, your SAM.gov data. So it's important that you protect that data. And it's important that you not, well, here, here's, here's an issue that's, that's occurring here recently. A lot of you are going to get uh, contacted by people who are offering to help you get in SAM.gov. People who help you get contracts. Those are not crooks. Those are those are valid companies. However, the federal government doesn't doesn't promote them, but it's what you're going to see. What you need to know is that if anytime you go out and you are doing a consultant for hire, make sure the contract list the deliverables that you're going to get. Make sure that you never give up control of your data, your passwords. You know, if they're going to set it up for you, then they should immediately give you the links and the password to it. And then you should check that you still have access because when that relationship with that pay consultancy dies, when that contract obligation is over, when all the deliverables have been met, you want to control your data. We cannot help you. I, I, not, I get this all the time recently. I cannot help you. No federal agency can help you access that data if you lose those. You have to start all over again. So it's important that you understand how important that it is for you as a small business, any business, that you control your information, your data, and access to it. Because I have actually had companies who fell out of their relationship with their consultant, the consultant ceased working the contract, and the consultant ceased delivering access to the data. More money in court. That's all you can do when you start all over again. So you wasted that money. And how to access the forecast too. This is just information that's gonna be in the slide presentation. You'll have this. It takes you through the process of how to get to the GSA forecast two, or what we're calling now the federal government forecast two. We're gonna rebrand that. It's just not ours anymore. But the two uh, actually started out in March, 2016. We launched it as a beta product. It's been improved year after year. It gets improved every year. It now has a line item budget for improvement. So it will get better. And more and more agencies will come to it because if we've already built this too, then they're gonna find it hard to justify an IT spend to reproduce this when the rest of it, when it already exists. That's one thing that the Office of Management and Budget looks at a lot about how we're spending the money. So the, the two focuses on acquisition planning and increases awareness of potential prime and subcontracting opportunity. That's its, its mission, that's its goal. The goal helps both GSA buyers and vendors easily communicate around a potential contracting opportunity. And the two also includes information for GSA, Department of Interior, Department of Labor, and the Small Business Administration. Now that was as of 2016, that has expanded. We'll just have to update this portion of the slide so we can catch the rest of those agencies. The goal is to have all federal agencies use the two. So you're going to actually see offers for training coming out on SAM.gov. And some that will be coming through to PTAC that offers you the chance to sit through 
a demonstration of how the forecast two actually works. So that we're actually going to launch that this summer. So you start seeing those type of training coming forward with cooperation of our partners within the federal and state levels. So what do you do? If you're looking for opportunities, remember we talk about money, the budgetary information, either in the budget, line item budget of, for state by state, agency by agency, you can find everything. And usually like GSA, if we're gonna do something in New England, in that budget line is gonna show that money that's hidden state by state projects. There are a lot of projects right now in the works for New England. So you're gonna see not only GSA, you're gonna see some transportation projects, which means some road work. You're gonna see uh, the federal courthouse in Hartford is one of our projects upgrading to the federal building as it exists right now. There in Hartford and down in New Haven, you're gonna see upgrades to those. So those are smaller jobs that you may be directly on, but the bigger jobs like building a new courthouse and, and stuff and some of the, the major construction around that, which means new highways and new roads to that building, uh, you may be a subcontractor. There may be subcontract opportunities. Find the key players uh, and within the agency. You know, I often tell people, if you're actually trying to find information about what's happening in any agency, when it's going to happen, and what type of money is there, you go to the program management office, not the contracting office. The contracting officer's role is to basically execute a contract. It's the program managers of those, at those agencies who go out and build new programs. They seek money for old programs. They are responsible for determining the statement of work. They are also, they're the ones who go out there and fight for the budget. So once they have the plan, they have the money, then they release all that to the contracting officer with a time frame in which they have to execute the contract, which is usually 30 to 90 days at the most. So until the contracting officer gets that release of that information, there's nothing they, they're doing. They, they just see a line item that's out there being worked by the program management office. They are not the, the belly button you want to touch. Program managers are at the concept. They're there doing the contracting. They're doing their doing the acceptance, the quality assurance, and they're there after the contract closes out to make sure that everything is paid off and whatever money it wasn't spent is moved back to the to our financial people. So they are really the people who are you need to get to. So if you ever having a one on one or you have a chance to talk to some of the program managers uh, in any federal agency, that's who you want to talk to especially if you, you're going after any type of military or DOD work. Upcoming opportunities, what opportunities do the agency have? You want to track those. What are their small business goals? The one thing I would warn you about when you see small business goals, you see the 20%, you see the 5%, you see the 3%. Understand those are goals. At the federal level, we cannot mandate anything. You, at the state and city level, you'll often see uh, contracting opportunities where I say a, a company must put this much of the contract into the woman-owned small business program uh, or the minority small business program. The federal government doesn't work that way. By statute and by law, we are not, we cannot force a contract towards a certain person. What we can do is set aside opportunities. We give you the opportunity to compete or we sit it off in a pool so that you can compete. But if you don't want it, if you don't show interest in it, it goes somewhere else. So remember, our goals are goals, not mandates. That's the key thing. We try to make these goals. Are we good at it? I, I think we're very good here in New England. I know GSA, the office that I oversee, I oversee small business goals. Uh, in my 15 year career with the agency, we have made every one of our socioeconomic goals from women on to search every veteran to hub zone, we, we've made them. Um, so that's one of the things, it takes a lot of negotiation and a lot of uh, working together to make sure that happens, to make sure that every time you do an opportunity, every time you write a contract, that before you 
put it out to a large business. You do everything you can to make sure that small businesses can do that work or they don't want to do that work. Sometimes it's, it's a technical issue. They just can't. Then sometimes it's like they just don't want to play with the federal government. I would offer up the fact that I understand that working with the federal agencies is not easy. It is, it's, it's, it's really a pain. I, I know because I hear your complaints and I watch the process on the outside, inside. And when I was a small business, I chose not to even think about it. Although we were selling high tech uh, IT, our, our, for, our goal was to sell commercial because we needed to make money as a startup. And we did not need to go spend all of our time chasing possibilities. We were chasing actual dollars. And I know that's what a lot of you are doing. So I understand it, but when you do get ready to play, we're here to make sure that you get a fair playing field. And that's the best we can offer you. Uh, competition, who's your competition? You know, who am, I, who am I up against? How long they've been in the game? They're 20, 30 year company and they've been doing this work like this. I would partner with them before I go up and compete against them. Team with them, try and pick their brains, try and find out what makes made them successful. Sit down and do some business to business type relationship where you may do some sub work for them, get to know their business strategy and how they got to be, how they got to be successful. You know, that's the one thing about it. If you're a successful company, it's pretty hard to hide how you got there. It's pretty uh, obvious and people can, can repeat that. So data, data, data. Utilize these tools for your market research. Market research is really how we determine whether or not a, a uh, requirement is going to stay in the small business um, arena or go worldwide. It'll get full and open, or we can keep it in the small. We keep it in the small, then we could break that down into the socioeconomics, like women on service area, veteran on hub zone. But if we don't keep it there and it goes out, then you as a small business are competing with everybody out there who may want the work. And sometimes that really puts you at a disadvantage because you don't have the resources. Uh, a lot of times you don't have the experience to write the proposals like people who do 20 or 30 of them a month all across the country. So if you're an IT company, rather than dealing with uh, Joe's and Bill's IT, you're competing against Raytheon or Groman or some of those guys. So when you're looking at the data, the GSA e-library has the latest GSA contract award information and then assesses your competition. So you can go in there and see who already has a GSA contract. And, you know, sometimes you can find out what, what they're getting paid, the price points and stuff. Uh, if you're talking about widgets, oftentimes you'll see this is what their peer, peer item is what they're charging. So it gives you a chance to kind of compare what you do and also to look at whether or not you actually want to compete in that space because you can't, if you can't beat their price, if you can't come, I say 10 up or 10 down, 10% up, 10% down, if you can't fall within that space and, and, and compete at that space, then usually it's not a good fit for you. Because if you're over 10%, then most of our people, the contracting officer gonna look and say, you're, you're overpricing. If you're under that 10%, way under that 10%, then people start looking at you like, you don't really know what you're doing because you're pricing yourself out of the market. We're used to paying a dollar for things. We paying a dollar for 50 years and you come in and you want to sell me something for $75. I have to wonder, am I getting a subpar product or is it you just don't know the price point? And if I give you the contract three, four months down the road, you're going to close that contract because you, you're going bankrupt. So we want you to make money. We want you to be profitable. And that's why it's good for you to see what the companies that are currently doing, what type of profits they're making and what type of pricing they have. Oh, uh, the schedule sales query plus, that's another database. It offers published sales data of schedules, um, the GSA schedules and all the contracts we have, you can go in there and find it. Um, you know, once again, all the contractors in there are already on schedule, the, the multiple watch schedule, which is uh, GSA's pre-compete uh, contract that you pre-compete for it. And then 
you actually can sell throughout the federal sector. So the federal sector becomes your whole market. So the advantage of, the, of that and being on the, the schedule is that once you're on that contract, you go into the GSA and build your, your offerings, you show your sales, you sh your, your offerings, you show what you want to sell, you show your, your shipping and all that and your pricing. And anybody around the world can go into that, that database and do an order to you. It is probably, that is the whole advantage of it. It's a way of marketing your, your goods and services worldwide and anybody can buy from you. But it also means you have to be capable of delivering anywhere. Always understand that anytime you take a contract uh, like this, like the MAS, you, you are mandated that you have to sell $25,000 a year, except for the first two years at your own contract. After that, it's $25,000 on the first two years, then $25,000 after. That's your sales. That's all you have to do to keep your contract valid and to stay in the program. If you drop below that program, that $25,000 in the third in subsequent years, then you get a warning saying, hey, your sales are low. You need to bring your sales up. What's your plan to bring them up? It's a, it's a whole marketing thing. Uh, our people work with you to make sure that you have the opportunities. Coming out of the pandemic, a lot of companies that hold these MAS schedules were not making sales because a lot of things weren't moving. The economy was stagnant. So a lot of that, those were extended. So it's a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. There's not a catch-all, fit-all. The, the program says $25,000 the first two years and every year after that. However, you can always talk to your contracting officer if you have a reason not to. So I tell companies that if you are thinking about the GSA schedule, that's a long-term thing in your business strategy and your business plan. That's something that you're going to work with your counselors and uh, go through the, the mock process of seeing whether well, it fits for you. Your short-term goal should always be to find where the quickest way to get work. That's subcontracting, that's direct uh, contracting on small jobs. And if you feel like you're there, it's direct contracting on large jobs. USA Spending, another database, is a repository for all government transactions and receipts. So you have to understand that that's a lot of information. And most of you as a small business probably are not gonna be comfortable uh, doing that work, that data dive, but that's another thing that you can work with uh, your consultant as a portion of your market analysis to see where you are in the USA spending, where your competitors are and what type of uh, contracts out there they're working on. The next code, the North American industry code is how we actually track things, opportunities. It's an identifier that basically uh, specific types of work. So once you have one, you, you put all that in sound.gov, but that's also how you track opportunities. So these, the next code and the PSC codes are two ways of tracking opportunities and how the agencies actually put the word out. This is what I need, mix code, blah, blah, blah. And we need 20 some widgets or we need a construction and we put a construction mix code out there. You won't see the PSC codes that much in GSA. We usually use the mix code for all our opportunities, but we're starting to also post the equivalent PSC because some of the DOD contractors are are using it a whole lot more, and we're doing a whole lot more DOD work. FPDSNG transition to sem.gov. That transition is complete. Only thing that means earlier, like I said, the opportunities, uh, RFG, RFI, RFGs, RFPs, are all going to be published in SAM.gov rather than in FPDS. There are still some reports that you can get out of FPDS. So when you're doing your market analysis, uh, strategic reports like the National Interest Action Reports, um, the Annual Small Business Goal and Reports, those things are still available in that database. I cannot say that they're being updated consistently, but the data is there. It's a good place for you to go look. 
And, and if you're searching for details on specific contracts, you can continue to use FPDS. And you can also remain the authority source for entering and viewing details about contract award data. What does that mean to you? It means that the data is split. So reports are available still in FPDS, but the new data is all flowing through uh, SAM.gov. My thing is, Go to SAM.gov first. If you can't find it there, go to FPDS and, and see if that still is still showing in there. Only thing about FPDS is I know a lot of our COs are not updating FPDS, but everyone now who's basically migrated to SAM.gov, but there's still a lot of data inside FPDS that may help you in doing your business analysis. Once again, that's in conjunction with your consultant. I would warn you as an individual, as a small business, that's a lot of time you're gonna waste going after data in those two documents, in those two platforms, but it can be done. And the biggest thing is, will it help you get um, to a contract quicker? I doubt that. Will it help you understand how the federal government buys? It, it may, it may not. Um, Personally, when we hired someone to take us through it one time when I was working startups and afterwards we was like, nah, it ain't for us. It's not for everybody. You really gotta be a, a data geek to, to go in there and make these type of things work. But fortunately for you, you have free resources that you can use either through PTAC, uh, it's the Small Business Development Center, WeBank or SCORE. Let those guys carry that water for you because I'm telling you, it, it's a headache reading it. Same thing, Federal Procurement Data System, the next generation, it just tells you what reports are in there. Remember, if it was in there, it's soon going to be in uh, SAM.gov. So, you no, know, it's a lot. It's a lot. But if you ever have questions, you ever get in there, you get stuck. We do have a federal service desk that you can call up and ask questions about it, um, who will give you insight if you need an update on how things are, they can update you. But once again, I hope you got a lot of time. That, that desk is slow. It is slow. Not because they, they don't care, it's because it is so many people calling in and they handle more than just FPDS. You know, the federal service desk handles sound.gov, FPDS, you know, all these other issues with all these other uh, data products. So sometimes if you have something that's really quick or something, you do better by making an appointment with your consultant rather than trying to go in and talk to these guys. And a lot of times, just like any help desk, when you talk to our help desk, it depends on how deep your problem is. You hit level one um, analyst or basically reading your scripts. They go through frequently asked questions and they read you off the answer, basically off a script. You can find that usually on the same on the website too. Okay. It's when you get into system uh, abnormalities, system issues, then they will escalate that to a higher level. And then you start getting someone who knows how the system generates things and how the system works. And that is one area where, you know, this is upper level troubleshooting. And that's when sometimes you don't really understand what these guys are saying. This is what I call the geek squad. These guys are sharp. They know the system. But a lot of times, they're not good at people skills. Uh, I say that because I came out of the geek squad. I came out of cryptographic. And I remember in those days when you get these phone calls and you'd be explaining to people and they'd shake their head like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that's what you have there. So the help desk is there to help you, but it's not always helpful. But use them if you have to. If not, get with your consultant, work the problems out, and make sure that when you ask a question, it's a valid question and, and not just something that you think is a question. It's a quick, or, or you go down the rabbit hole real quick. GSA subcontracting uh, directory. This is actually a, a portion of our database uh, for gsa.gov that actually has a listing of all the people who, all the agencies, not agencies, but the vendors who currently have contracts who have subcontracting plans. Those are the people who are actively looking for subcontracting uh, partners 
they're looking for supply chain um, improvements. So this is a place you can go and look and find them and say, hey, they buy what I, they're looking for my type of goods, my type of services, reach out to them, become a subcontractor to them. Uh, the subcontracting criteria, subcontracting provides additional opportunities to obtain experience as a federal contractor. It's always a good way to get your feet wet, go through subcontracting and go into direct contract. Other than small businesses are required to submit subcontracting plan when the total value award is expected to exceed $750,000 or $1.5 million in construction. What does that mean? Most of these companies, large companies who have contracts for, you know, $750,000 or $1.5 million must have a subcontracting plan, subcontracting plan that's actually reviewed and validated by my office. It's also reviewed by SBA. It's an administrative review, but we hold those things pretty serious because that's where most of the opportunities really lie. Working in the federal space as a small business is with subcontracting work. Um, plans must demonstrate a maximum practical opportunities or effort, as we like to say, for small business to participate. Remember, maximum practical demonstrates those are words that are not uh, directive, they're more, well, this is what they should be doing. So the goals are goals. They're not mandates, but we, we push them to try and de deliver what they promise, basically. And a lot of time they promise us a lot. And then at the end of the year, when we start doing our reports, we realize that they haven't, they haven't for years. So that's when the next time they come up for our plan, that's when we challenge their plan and say, okay, you got to do better. You know, you you haven't made your goals in three to four years. Um, we want you to really do better and show us a plan of how you're going to do better. So, as a company, you should be capable of responding to an RFI and source your solve notice. You should attend industry days. You should strategically manage your time at matchmaking events. In, and network with other GSA contractors. And, I, and I, I can't overstress the fact that networking at these events is usually where you're, you're gonna really make the money. And it, it just is, it's just the conversation I've noticed of companies having together always are more fruitful than the, the ones they have with the agencies because the agencies are giving you five minutes at the 10 minutes at the most to talk to them where some of you guys have lunch together and you build relationships that lead to a lot of better and uh, different things. And keep checking the GSA eBuy for opportunities. Uh, it constantly changes. The forecast is uh, constantly updated. Right now, the requirement is once a quarter, they update the forecast. You're going to see some things on the forecast that's not going to make sense to you about timing. Remember that the forecast normally is an agency's wish list. It's what we want to do. We put it out there to the world. This is what we want to do in FY 2023 during that fiscal year. But if the money doesn't come through, that, that, that won't is still out there. It's an unfilled a project. There's no money. Remember I said follow the money? There's no money tied to it. So it's still sitting out there. This is what GSA wants to do. This is what Corps of Engineers want to do. This is what uh, Homeland Security wants to do. This is what we, we have projects for. We just don't have the funding. Remember the program manager is, is the one who's moving his stuff ahead. So when his projects are approved, it usually goes on um, the opportunities, the forecast a lot of times. But until that money is done, until all that's turned over to the contracting officer, there is not a valid opportunity there for you to go after. So going after that will really be a waste of your time. If you see something like that and you get on the phone, whoever you get from the agency, ask the question, has this project been funded? If it hasn't been funded, when do you think it will be funded? And when do you think you'll be ready to go to contracting? Those questions are vital to you to make sure that you're not wasting your time. So these are additional solutions. These are people we work with all the time. We work with SBA. We work with the Minority Business Development Agency, APTAC, which is now called the Apex Accelerator Group. Uh, that's the old PTAC. So if you have any questions about GSA, 
There's our links there to our events and to our small business resources. We have a lot of things out there to explain the federal sector. Remember, GSA is as a buying entity buys for everybody in the federal sector, everybody, including DOD. The only thing we don't buy is, is weapon systems and munitions. But the trigger that goes with the gun, you can buy that off of GSA. Yeah, you can actually go to a GSA contract and buy guns. Um, so we used to sell guns and bullets, but now it's like weapon systems. We don't buy weapon systems and we don't uh, buy bullets. But a lot of our contractors out there offer so many things. So GSA is that portal to reach everybody. is a place where you can go to learn about other agencies, get information. GSA has 11 regional offices around the country. And because we have 11 offices and most of the agencies don't have one, a lot of times we act as the front door to the federal sector for purchasing and opportunities. If we can't do it, if we don't use it, we could be buying it for another agency. We have something in GSA called assisted services, which we have a team that around the country and they actually market GSA contracts to other agencies so that those agencies use our contracts rather than producing their own contracts. So in that instance, GSA is probably the first place you want to get to know if you're going to go into federal contracting. Either construction, we do construction, we build buildings, we maintain buildings, we do landscaping, we do snow removal, uh, we do land <laughs> landscaping, landscaping and landscaping, landscaping. So we also do historical restoration. And we also have uh, a disaster team that goes around to fix leaking walls uh, because a lot of our older buildings sit close to the water edges and stuff. So a lot of those buildings have water issues. So we have people come in, contractual people come in and clean stuff up, um, remediation, mold removal, all that type of thing. So, and believe it or not, we actually have places where you can sell water. We have cafeterias. We run cafeterias in all our federal buildings. We actually manage and contract a lot of stuff at a lot of the presidential libraries. The National Archives is on our inventory. All those type of buildings, uh, the old custom houses on the, on the coast of New Bedford, Salem, uh, you know, those are GSA facilities. We are in the process of transferring lighthouses and stuff. So there's so much we do. So it's always good to have the conversation. Uh, even if we're not buying it, we can usually point you to someone who is. If there's anybody in the federal sector buying it, we can point you to those people because that's usually what we consider our competition because someday we're going to gobble them up and, and replace them. So we're on a process now of growing our offerings, growing our business lines. We are the lead for the uh, technology transformation of the federal sector, which means that all the different IT systems that are upgrades and all that stuff is going through GSA Federal Acquisition Service fast through the technology modification fund is something that sits with GSA. So those type of things are, are global reaching their entire federal sector type of issues. So if you have, and remember, we also own, we are the ones who manage the federal car fleet, which we right now we have about $2 billion to upgrade the federal fleet and also to install uh, electric chargers. We're migrating to all electric vehicles rather than gas operated vehicles. So there's a lot of things we, we, we're in. Um, the good thing about GSA, you, most people say, you, you, you know, we, we are really good at providing goods and services that we will never consume. And there's an old African uh, proverb about the man who plants trees that he will never sit up on and never uh, feel the, the, the coolness of the shade. That's GSA. We do things where we will never see them. We'll never really have to have the opportunity to do to use those products, but that's what we did. So it's, it's, a, it's a good place to be right now and I'm enjoying it. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this portion of the presentation because now we get to go to your questions. So, yeah, thank you, Jerry, that was great. Uh, we'll now use the remaining time for a little Q and A. Um, we'll take as many as we can till one o'clock. So you can type them in the chat window if you want. The first one that came in was quite a while ago. It actually said, how do you get a UEI number? 
or designation? You go into SAM.gov. You go into SAM.gov and there's a process in there. Uh, remember the UEI used to be the Dun and Brad Street, which we no longer use. And those people who had Dun and Brad Streets were actually uh, automatically converted to a UEI. But there is a process within SAM.gov there where you go in and you apply for UEI. Right. Okay. Uh, next question was, how can I get prime vendors for subcontracting in the IT staffing space? So you, if you want to be a subcontractor uh, and you're looking to subcontract, I always say DOD trillion dollar companies are the best place to go because they are always hiring, they're always firing, they're always retiring people. So they have the biggest churn out there when you look at it. The federal government itself has a process for hiring and we use it on outsource that. That goes to the Office of Personnel Management, OPM. But our vendors, our prime vendors like Raytheon, Groman, Swarovski, uh, these are people right here in your backyard. Um, Coat Firearms, SIG uh, Firearms, all those companies are starting to ramp up. SIG just won a contract with the, the uh, military that's a multi-billion dollar contract to provide the new weapon systems for personal carry from side arms to, to long rifles to sniper rifles. They are ramping up hiring. And if you can help them meet those numbers, help them sort those, those are good opportunities right now. And I would be reaching out to those guys now. Um, who is it? The guys who, uh, uh, Groman, General Electric, G Boat, all those guys are huge. And all of them have personnel. Even MIT, places like MIT, who is a federal contractor, will be looking for someone to help them with their hiring and firing and replacement or whatever. And then a lot of it's about teaching people about opportunities for health insurance and all that long-term stuff. So that's the quickest way. You will not find many agencies who are actually outsourcing their HR. That's an internal thing right now because the federal process is a whole lot different. But if you have background in the federal process, uh, I would look at it. But if you're gonna go, go to OPM and they should be able to tell you exactly who out there may be looking for it. Got it. Uh, next question is, how can I find out the next Meet the Buyers event? Also, how do I get a contract contract with a procurement officer at the DLA? Now, remember, Defense Logistics Agency is basically, uh, they buy widgets and, and things. And DLA has a small business office. So you can go on, uh, on their website and do a Google search for DLA Office of Small Osdebu, and it's going to pull up, and there's a, a point of contact there, the director's office, and you can reach out to them for events that DLA is sponsoring. There are events that other agencies are sponsoring year-round around the country. And like I said, you just decide which one you want to follow. You can either follow the GSA model, uh, a GSA events, or you can go out and follow DOD events. There is a big uh, a service, well, it's a training event that's coming up in Baltimore uh, in the summer. The summer is usually when you'll see a lot of these events. So first thing is, if you know who you wanna look for, go look at their website, look under the small business offices, everyone has one, and it will tell you about events, it will tell you about resources for that agency. Got it. Next one's kind of long, so let me uh, see, okay. I have a SAM.gov registration and an NAICS number, but am having difficulty finding any contracts under the medical devices product, which I sell. I currently sell to several veterans, medical hospitals or independently to Air Force medical supply requests, but would like to get into TRICARE or military hospital circuits. I have talked to various military doctors and nurses at conventions that state that all branches work differently in, our, in terms of their sourcing and contracting. How do I navigate this matrix of systems in getting into the military hospital arenas or TRICARE? If you go to the TRICARE website, you're gonna notice that TRICARE is divided by different zones, east, west, southwest zones. And each one of those or has a contractor that's responsible for it. So when you think of TRICARE, TRICARE is not a office you walk into, it's not an entity, it's a virtual medical system 
that has uh, relationships with different medical centers. So TRICARE is just like insurance. That's all it is, it's insurance. TRICARE doesn't do any type of medical, TRICARE doesn't buy any type of equipment. What TRICARE does is, is basically certify personnel with military, you know, whatever, and then they take that TRICARE insurance and they go out and they do an in TRICARE system provider or they go to an outside provider. So there is no TRICARE to go to knock on their doors. If you're looking to sell medical supplies directly to an agency, it is the VA. The VA is the only agency that maintains a hospital system. The other medical systems that you're, you're talking about and why they tell you that everyone has different ones, because the Navy has its medical system, the medical corps. The Air Force has a medical corps. The Air Force has certain hospitals geographically separated based upon the major installation, like Andrews is by probably right now the sharpest place to go, Andrews Air Force Base for Air Force. Bethesda, Maryland, it's the best place to go if you want to find out about the Navy. Uh, there used to be Fort Sam Houston down in Texas used to be a good place if you specialize in burn type of stuff like that. They have a big burn center down there. And then there's also San Antonio area where that's where um, Fort Sam Houston is in San Antonio. But um, I, I it just skipped. There's a big Air Force Medical Center right there in San Antonio to Wifford Hall. Wilford Hall is the is the second biggest, probably the biggest Air Force medical facility. And then you have the Air Force hospital systems overseas. You have one, a big one in, in uh, Yokota, Japan. My son actually works at that hospital. Then you have one in England at RF Lake and Heat. So that's why they're saying that that's a hard touch. But if you go to the command centers, you look for the commands. That's where everything, the programs, that's where the needs all source. Remember, program managers. Program managers sit at those commands. Sometimes they're doctors, sometimes they're nurses, but their job is to provide the goods and services to support those hospitals scattered around the world and around the country. So Navy Medical, you can have to go to, you can find that quicker by going to the bigger centers, like, but that's where it'll have links there to take you to the, to the next level. Or you can always reach out to those people to reach out to their business office, and then they can actually point you to whoever it is that you need to go to. It is a hard nut to crack. Um, if you if you're owned by a service disabled veteran on small business, then the VA of course had vet first, which allows you to seek direct contracts with the VA that no one else can get. So that's an advantage. If you don't have a veteran-owned company or a small disadvantaged veteran-owned company, then you will have to basically knock on a lot of doors. It, it, is, it. it is hard. Got it. Next question is, how can I get the accounting slash CPA services subcontracts? Uh, you're going to find the, you have to find the primes to do that work in the federal sector. Remember that data analysis? Do a data analysis, find the big dogs, chase them down and ask them who's looking for this, who's looking for partners, who's looking for subcontracting, Price Waterhouse, you know, Booz Allen are some of the biggest ones that we're using right now. Those guys are always looking to meet their subcontracting plan. I actually reviewed uh, Booz Allen's sub K plan and I think they were projecting putting almost uh, 700 to a billion dollars into uh, small businesses in, in the upcoming year. So they're 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 looking for you mm, very good and next one is uh are there any programs you recommend for managing procurement when you said programs for managing procurement you talk about a database a, a app or something like that um there's really not if you're talking about just tracking when procurements actually pop up you can do that through the PTAC. They got the, one of the better systems I know of that's free that allows you to basically get an email every time an opportunity pops up in your NICS code. Once you sign up as a, a, a one of their customers, they will follow all that for you and do all that work for you so you don't have to do it yourself. Got it. Next one is I would like to know uh, for determining small business size, standard is faracquisition.gov or SBA the primary authority that takes precedence? 
SBA. SBA. It's their job to, to do size determinations. Got it. Uh, next one is how soon will the subcontracting for the new projects you mentioned become available? The industry days will be reported and we will actually advertise those through the PTAC, through SBA, through school. We're going to let all you guys know when that stuff is coming. We'll send it to the chamber. We have all your emails and contacts and we will keep you guys in the loop as this stuff comes available. But right now we don't have the firm dates because we're still projecting. Remember, we're focusing on the border station now and then we'll come down south and start focusing on the work down south. Yeah. Very good. Uh, next one is, is there an opportunity and where to look for digital advertising or digital marketing? There are opportunities right now, but you're going to have to go to, like I said, the usually it's at the agency heads. Uh, I know the Army is now looking for people that are rolling out new promotions because they weren't making their uh, quotas. So they're starting to market heavy. But a lot of the federal agencies don't market that that much if anything they will have a, a different links they'll have a twitter page and all this stuff and they'll post stuff on there every one of the agencies actually has a public uh, public affairs or office of communication that's where you can go to talk to those agencies about possibilities of augmenting their their workforce or taking up special projects with them great okay those are all the questions we have time for today as a reminder a recording of this webinar and the materials will be available within the next day or so. Uh, and it'll be under the on demand section. I think you'll be sent a link to this and I think you will have to rewatch this. This is a lot of facts and a lot of it was verbal. Uh, so I would suggest you replay this as often as you need. Again, SCORE offers free individual counseling. So please use the uh, link that's in our website, click on request a mentor. Also, please fill out your evaluations that have been sent at the end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's live webinar. In closing, a big thank you to our sponsors and to Diana Washington. Excuse and, me, Tim. Yep. May I ask Jerry one question? Would sure. it be all right for, for those people that didn't get their questions answered, if they could email you? It's at the end of the slide presentation right there. and. Uh... It's pretty easy to get a hold of me. It's jerry.d.smith at gsa.gov or go into the www.gsa.gov website and the small business and I pop first as region one. Okay, so their answers, so their questions can be answered today. Thank you so yes. much. Yes. Yes, Thank thanks, you, Jerry. Too. Thanks, Diana. Okay. Thank and you for joining thanks us. Thanks for everybody to, uh, for joining us today. Goodbye.